back when we talked about polarity of bonds, one of the things that came up was that eventually we'd have to stitch together what's happening on an entire molecule and think about all of those bonds together. We finally reached that point. So now that we can draw things in three dimensions, if we want to know the polarity of an entire molecule, the first thing we'll do is we'll draw that molecule in 3D. That lets us visualize exactly where all of our bonds are actually going to be in three dimensions. Now we're going to decide for each of those bonds if they're polar, and if so, we're going to draw that polar arrow. And remember, the arrowhead points toward the more electronegative atom. The positive end of the arrow points toward the electropositive atom, in other words, the one that's least electronegative. And that'll tell us something about which direction the electrons are going to be sitting. Now if we visualize what's happening in three dimensions, if they're all balancing each other out, it's still going to be a nonpolar molecule, even though it has polar bonds. But if that molecule is lopsided in three dimensions in any way, that's going to make it be a polar molecule. So we cannot think about the polarity of a molecule when we're still in flatland. It's got to be inflated into 3D. If you were to try it in 2D, you will have mistakes. So make sure you inflate to three dimensions first. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of this. So you can picture this molecule. In fact, if you wanted to go the whole way through and do the Lewis structure for it, we could write carbon. We have our four fluorines. I have a fluorine, a fluorine, a fluorine, and my last of the fluorines. Each F brings seven electrons. Carbon has four electrons. I've got one carbon. I have four fluorines, 28 total from there. Another four from carbon gives me a total of 32 electrons to work with. So I have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 22, uh, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, and 32. Incidentally, you heard me just kind of stutter past a set of numbers and make a mistake. If you see something weird at the end where you're like, this, this doesn't seem like a structure that I've seen before, the first thing you should do very carefully recount the electrons you have drawn to make sure you've actually drawn how many you think you have. I did that in one of my earlier videos, I think two or three times, and I had to restart the recording each time. So make sure you catch yourself on those yourself before it ends up, you know, being on an exam question. All right, so we see here that we have our full octet filled for everything, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, and eight. So the outside fluorines are set, the carbon is set. That means it's AX4, one, two, three, four bonding regions. AX4, no E's, no electron pairs. Tetrahedral geometry, and you see that drawn in right there. Okay, so we've just kind of done all the background that was sitting here already for us in this sketch. Now we know fluorine is the most electronegative atom on our periodic table. And so the arrow should be pointing up toward it. It's definitely a polar bond. In fact, remember, carbon was about, what, 2.1 for its electronegativity. Fluorine is at the maximum of 4. Delta En is at 1.9. If we got any further apart, these things were going to be ionic. So it's already a really, really, really polar bond. Giant polar arrow there. But when I draw this into three dimensions, you can see that, at least hopefully you can see that, in the three-dimensional tug of war that's going on, they are totally balanced out in three dimensions. And so this is going to be a non-polar molecule. Now, if that's one that you're not so sure about, if, if you can't quite visualize that, in class, make sure that you come in and maybe come a few minutes early or stick around a couple minutes after. We'll pull out some of the modeling kits from the closet, and I've got some little drinking straws that I cut into small little uh, polar arrows that you can slide over top of the bonds. That way you can actually set it up in three dimensions and actually have a physical model in front of you so you can figure out would these things actually be lopsided in three dimensions. 
So make sure you talk to me if you need a, an example of that. And hopefully we'll even do it in class. But if not, you know, make sure you ask me for one of the kits to try out before you leave the room. Okay, now the slide's a little bit cleaned up. Let's take a look over at this next example. Suppose we are given CF3H or CHF3. Well, we go ahead and we draw that. Might as well do our Lewis structure for that as well. But on this, I'm going to use my shortcutted version. Carbon typically has four bonds. Hydrogen only gets to have one, and it's always a terminal atom. Can't be in the central, in other words, uh, center, in other words. Fluorine also going to be a terminal atom. Only allowed to have one bond because it's a halogen. It's already at seven electrons originally. Sharing one in gives it eight, so it's got its octet even if we didn't draw in the electron pairs, but I can go ahead and sketch those in. And we can visualize pretty quickly, we're going to have the same layout in terms of the bonding as we did over in this example. And we see that inflated into three dimensions here. The hydrogen could have been in any of these spots whatsoever, and in fact if this were tumbling in three dimensions like it really would be, it really will be in any of those spots. But just to make the drawing easy, I put the hydrogen upward. No big deal there. Now, let's think through what we're doing with our polar arrows. Again, we have that, we have that, and we have that. Our arrows are pointing out toward fluorine, and all of these are the same size. Now, we know that the carbon-hydrogen bond, we say it's nonpolar. The only thing that's more nonpolar than it is two atoms that are the same bonded together, like a carbon-carbon bond. That would be totally neutral in its electronegativity difference. But this is so close that we just say it's nonpolar. But picture what's happening in three dimensions. Side to side, they're all canceling out because they're still going to have, and here, let me just do a quick top view. From the top view, it looked like this. We have this one pointing forward. We have this one going backward. And this one's in the plane of the paper, so I guess I've rotated it just a little bit. So in this plane, though, you can see that the side to side part is neutralizing out. And this side to side part is neutralizing out. Half of the intensity going this way times two neutralized out by this. But what isn't neutralizing out is the fact that they're all pointing generally downward. So overall this molecule is going to have a polar arrow pointing straight down for its overall polarity. So this is going to be a polar molecule. It's got polar bonds. It has a polar molecule. This one has polar bonds and is a non-polar molecule. Make sure that you do this in three dimensions and don't just think about it in 2D because you will definitely get these sort of things wrong.